Jesus is the good shepherd. What does that mean? We'll talk about it tonight in John chapter 10. Well, welcome back to the Sawyer's Family Bible Study. We are uh, hoping you're having a good Lord's Day. We're thankful that you have chosen to study uh, in the Gospel of John with us tonight. We uh, are in John chapter 10 as we continue through the Gospel of John. If you've missed out on any of these studies, you can find them in all the places that you have found tonight's studies. The Bear Valley Church of Christ YouTube channel, the Bear Valley Church of Christ Facebook page, the Bear Valley Bible Institute Facebook page, my Facebook page. If you would, please let us know where you're watching from. Comment on this video, uh, like and share this video, and most importantly, we hope you'll take your Bibles out and study along with us. There's lots of these kind of studies being put out right now. We say it, uh, I think, every Bible study, but there are a lot of them being put out right now, and we are thankful and humble that you have chosen to study along with us, and hopefully, what we uh, look at in John chapter 10 will be uh, beneficial to you. John chapter 10 is a, that's a great chapter uh, because there are so many familiar concepts and verses in John 10. There's also a number of great lessons in John 10. And he begins in verse one, this is Jesus talking. Now remember the conversation that we ended chapter nine with, there's no indication that that the scene has shifted and yet the the tone and what he's going to talk about is is really a little bit different but in chapter 9 you had these people that were unwilling to see the evidence in front of them the blind man could see what those who saw chose to be blind about uh, the only reason they didn't get who Jesus was was because they chose not to see him they chose not to hear him and that's really an important concept that you're gonna see in John chapter 10. It begins in verse one. Truly, truly, I say to you, he who does not enter the sheepfold by the door, but climbs in by another way, that man is a thief and a robbers. But you have another one of these truly, truly statements that we've talked about so many times. You're gonna have actually another one in uh, verse seven of this chapter as well. And there are some people that, that call this teaching a parable. It's not really, it's a figure of speech. Um, there's not, that's one of the things unique about John is he really doesn't have the parables like we see in the other gospel accounts. What we do have in, in this passage is, is just kind of talking about the way that life really was in Palestine during the time that Jesus lived on this earth. Um, you, you've got his, his, he's going to talk about caring for sheep and we've got to keep it in that context of the, the time and the place in which Jesus is writing uh, or is rather is giving this information, the time and place in which John is writing this. In the first century in Palestine, shepherding was done vastly different than it's done today in, in our culture. Um, in Colorado where we live, there's Lots of sheep farmers. There's not so many in West Tennessee where we're from and where we are, obviously, right now in my father-in-law's uh, Tennessee room. But, um, you know, I've talked with a lot of, of sheep farmers. I used to say that sheep were dumb. I had a sh actually a sheep farmer in Tennessee when I was preaching in Macedonia inform me that they are not dumb. They're just very helpless. They need lots of help. And and thus a need for a shepherd. But uh, you know, I've talked with, with lots of guys that sheep farm out in Colorado and they talk about turning them loose up in the mountains and then they'll take four wheelers and dogs and drive them where they wanna go and drive them back home. And that's not the way things were done back in those days. Um, in those days, you had a shepherd that cared for the sheep. You had these, these sheep uh, folds that, that he's gonna get into um, a little bit greater in detail a little bit later, but he mentions here in verse one, they, they were these enclosures that were made out of brush and rock and whatever the shepherd could find to make a sort of a corral. It was very crude. Uh, wasn't a, like a formal pen with a fencing like, like we might think of it. Just kind of a makeshift way to, to 
protect the sheep when they bed down at night. They would make a little gate or a door on them and anyone who had a legitimate reason to see the shepherd or to do something with the sheep would come to the door. Anyone not using that door would be up to no good. And we get that concept at two o'clock in the morning overnight. If somebody is climbing through a window into the house here, we're going to assume they're up to no good because that's not the way to get into the house. That, that's what Jesus is talking about. Jesus is talking about shepherding. He's talking about sheep. He's assuming that, that everyone who's hearing this knows what it is that he's talking about because basically everyone in Palestine had sheep. Uh, sheep. They had goats, those types of things. He's going to say later on in verse 9 that he is the door of this sheepfold. The, those sheepfolds that were used for safety. You would go through the door in and you'd find safety. You would go out the door and you would find pasture. So this isn't a story about a particular thing. This is just the way things are in that time and place. And people who live in that time and place, they would understand all this. They would understand that he's teaching about something they do so that they can understand the concept. He's not talking about something that they didn't know. But it is it is a figure of speech. Jesus is not really a shepherd in that he has a flock of sheep he's taking care of. That's not what he's saying. So there's a deeper meaning like so many things that we see in John. There's a deeper meaning to all of this. In John chapter 10 and verse 11, if you jump on down, he's going to say that he's the good shepherd. Well, how is that? Well, he's going to tell us that the shepherd seeks the abundant life for his sheep. He wants what is good and best for them. He wants them to flourish, a shepherd does. And, and our shepherd, Jesus, wants us to have the abundant life. That's not a prosperity gospel kind of idea. That's the life that he's been talking about all through the Gospel of John, that relationship with the Lord. He wants his sheep to know that they belong to him. Um, you know, a lot of times these sheepfolds were used by two or three shepherds that would all bring their sheep together um, at night. It would allow them to kind of, um, you know, take turns in watching the sheep, that kind of thing, safety in numbers, that sort of thing. Uh, so all three might drive their sheep in the sheepfold and camp out in the morning. In order to take my sheep out, I would just call to my my sheep that were in the sheepfold and they would know my voice and they would follow me out to the shepherd, uh, to the, uh, the pasture rather. And they knew who their shepherd was. They knew his voice and he's going to talk about that in verse 16 of this chapter. He talked about that in chapter 8 in verses 37 and 43 and they're going to follow him. So to be one of his sheep, we want to be one of Jesus' sheep. To be one of Jesus' peeps, you've got to be one of his sheep. And to be one of his sheep, you've got to listen to his voice and you've got to follow him. Plus, you're not going to follow a stranger. So there, there's some good thoughts in this as far as leadership goes. One of the, the biblical terms that we use to talk about uh, elders, the leaders of the church today, is a shepherd. That's a, a scriptural term for them. So uh, you a lot of good lessons for for shepherds today just in this in this chapter you you got to know the people if you're going to lead them they got to know you they got to know your voice they got to be used to hearing you those types of things that's what jesus says um, is that uh, this truly truly statement amen amen is all about the shepherd and the sheep he says in verse 2 but he who enters by the door is the shepherd of the sheep so verses two through five here, you're going to see some truisms. These are, these are just some facts. This is just the way that things are. He's the shepherd. He's not sneaky. So in verse three, he says, to him the gatekeeper opens, the sheep hear his voice, and he calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. When he has brought out all of his own, he goes before them, and the sheep follow him, for they know his voice. A stranger they will not follow, but they will flee from him, for they do not know the voice of strangers. See, shepherd did, shepherds didn't drive their sheep back then. They lead them. Shepherds today in the church need to understand that you can't drive the congregation to do anything. You've got to lead them. So you want an evangelistic congregation? Shepherds have got to be evangelistic. 
You want a, a friendly congregation, shepherds have got to be friendly. You want a hospitable congregation, shepherds have got to be hospitable. You want an involved congregation, shepherds have got to be involved. Um, you want a spiritual congregation, shepherds have got to be spiritual. It, it goes back to one of my favorite uh, lines from any movie, from Remember the Titans, attitude reflects leadership, Captain. And it just does. Uh, so not cracking the whip, but leading out of love. You might look at Hebrews 13 and verse 7 if you want to write that in your text there. If they truly believe that you're a man of God, if they truly believe that, that uh, you're um, someone who's trying to live for the Lord, follow Jesus and respect you, they know you're speaking the Word of God, you, they know you're looking out for their best interest, they're People will follow you, and they'll do so willingly. Uh, but, but that's what it takes. Now, the point that Jesus is really trying to make here is, is that He is all those things. He is the Good Shepherd, He's going to say here in a few more minutes. And so there's no doubt that, that we ought to be following Him. Um, it, it could be that if shepherds, if a congregation is not heading in the right direction, it could be that local shepherds are not leading in the right direction. But for the, the flock as a whole, okay, the church as a whole, our shepherd is Jesus. He's the one in charge. And if, if we're not heading in the right direction, it's not a leadership problem. It's a failure to follow leadership problem is what it really is. Okay? In verse 6 then, he says this figure of speech Jesus used with them, but they did not understand what he was saying with them. You know, Jesus had tried almost every imaginable way, but they still haven't been able to fully figure out who he is, nor what he's really here for. So, verse 7, Jesus says again to them, here's another one, truly, 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 I say to you, I am the door of the sheep. All who come before me are thieves and robbers, but the sheep did not listen to them. See, he is the shepherd, but he's also the door to the sheepfold. And uh, this goes back to, if you hold your finger there and you turn back in your Bibles to Ezekiel chapter 34, um, this was terminology, this figure of speech that he's using. Don't, don't think it's, it's that we don't get what... Um, they didn't understand what Jesus was talking about. We don't get it because we don't understand that this is a figure of speech. This was not a, the first time this figure of speech was used. If you look back in Ezekiel chapter 34, beginning in verse 1 and really going down through uh, verse 11, what he's going to talk about is, is the, the shepherds of Israel and how that they weren't really caring about Israel. They only cared about themselves. The shepherds were the leaders of Israel. And those leaders of Israel, God is saying through Ezekiel that they only care about themselves. They don't really care about Israel. The sheep, uh, they had not laid down their life for them. So in verse 11 of Ezekiel 34, it says, For thus says the Lord God, Behold, I, I myself will search for my sheep, and I will seek them out as a shepherd seeks out his flock when he's among his sheep that have been scattered. So will I seek out my sheep and I'll rescue them from all places where they've been scattered on a day of clouds and thick darkness. So what, what God is saying through Ezekiel is is that the shepherds of Israel haven't done a good job of being a shepherd. So what's going to happen, God says, is I'm going to have to come be the shepherd to my sheep. You haven't done the job. You haven't done it well. You haven't really done it at all. So I'm going to be the one to have to come and gather my, my sheep together and be a, a shepherd to my people, to my sheep. So when Jesus says, I'm the shepherd, going back to Ezekiel chapter 34, it's really another way of Jesus saying, I am God. And they would have understood that. And this is just another one of those signs that points out that Jesus is God. Remember, that's what the point of this book is. John 20, 30 through 31. We say it almost every class, I think. But that's the purpose of the book. 
is that these signs will help us believe that Jesus is the Messiah, that He is the Christ, that He is the Anointed One, and believing in that, that we can have eternal life. We can have that right relationship with Him. Jesus is saying, when you read back in, in Ezekiel 34, verses 11 and 12, God saying, I'm going to come be the shepherd to Israel, that's me. And, and Israel had had shepherds, uh, good shepherds at times, mostly bad. Uh, you might write down Numbers chapter 27, verses 16 through 17 talks about that. Moses was a shepherd of Israel. Joshua was a shepherd. The uh, elders of Israel were a shepherd. Uh, Exodus chapter 18. The prophets and priests were seen as shepherds. The kings were supposed to be shepherds. But their leaders had led them the wrong way. Uh, Jeremiah prophesied about, prophesied about in Jeremiah chapter 5 and 6 and eight about how that the priests and prophets were leading God's people in the wrong direction. First uh, Kings chapter ten and verse nine, he says, "That's what I put you there for was to lead my people." So what if they don't care about what God says? What if the leadership that God put in place doesn't care what responsibilities God gave them, and doesn't care about the sheep that they're leading? Well, then God says, "I have to go." and shepherd myself because the shepherds, they hadn't been doing it right. So think about the times of Jesus. There were priests, there were Pharisees, there were scribes, there were the elders. Oftentimes you see them coming, these, these groups of people coming to Jesus to ask Him about things. In the time of Jesus, they were the shepherds, but they didn't care about the people. They just cared about themselves just like Ezekiel had said. Ezekiel tells us to watch out for those thieves and the robbers. The same kind of thieves and robbers that he talked about in verse 1 here of chapter 10. The strangers that he talked about in verse 5. The wolves that he's going to talk about down in verse 12. These hirelings. Uh, most of the time, um, what you had out in the field was you had people that weren't really the owners of the sheep. They were they were hired shepherds. They were guys that will, um, you know, they didn't have any vested interest in the flock. So they would do their job as long as the money kept coming. But uh, it's one of those, you know, my job's, my life's not worth this job kind of deal. Uh, lots of them, whenever the going, you know, you see David talking about when he was tending his father's sheep, how that when a lion and a bear tried to get the sheep, what did David do? Well, he stood up to that lion and bear, right? Because he was going to make sure those were his father's sheep. They were his sheep to a certain extent. He was going to make sure that they were taken care of. But if you didn't have that vested interest, that familial uh, investment into those sheep, what are you going to do when a lion and bear attacks? You're going to say, eat the sheep, not me, right? And, and, and that's the kind of idea with these hirelings that he's going to talk about later on in verse 12, these hired hands that really don't care about the sheep themselves. In verse 9, he says, I am the door. If anyone enters by me, he will be saved and will go in and out and find pasture. The thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I came that they may have life and have it abundantly. See, he has a different motive. The thief wants the sheep. The shepherd wants what's best for the sheep. Well, there's some powerful parallels you can draw with shepherding today, can't you? If you're an elder of a congregation, if you're a preacher of a congregation, do you just want more sheep? Do you want more numbers on the board? Or do you want what's best for the sheep and the flock that you have? Uh, the thief wants the sheep. Jesus is the good shepherd. So he wants what's best for the sheep. Well, what, what is it that he wants for them? What he wants for them is that they might have life and have it abundantly. This life in the Gospel of John is eternal life. It is your relationship with Jesus. It is your relationship with God. John chapter 17, verses 1 through 3. It's to know God and to know Christ. That's eternal life. And that's why he came. 
And that's what He wants for His sheep. So who has your best interest as heart? As far as people is concerned, really and truly, there's just a handful of people that really have your best interest at heart. Uh, there's lots of people that may care about you. There's lots of people that may love you and value you. But really and truly, there's very few people that really have your best interest at heart. That would rather you have what's best for you, even if it hurts them or takes away from what they need or want or desire, those types of things. When you feel like there's a Christian leader who is really one who has your best interest at heart, no personal agenda. He just wants what's best for you. Doesn't that inspire you to follow them? Jesus is, it, you know, we have this idea, well, well um, you know, my parents are just trying to hold me down or the elders are just trying to hold me back or my boss is just trying to hold me down or um, maybe even the Lord is just trying to to hold me back or cramp my style. And isn't that at all? It's that He's trying to protect you from the wolves, from the hired hands. He's trying to do what's best for you. So when He says that marriage is an institution that should be for one man and one woman for life, why is He saying that? Because He has your best interest at heart. When He's saying that, that uh, husbands ought to love their wives as their own body and in Christ is as Christ did the church, why is He saying that? Because He wants you to be a softy? No. It's because He wants what's best for you. Uh, when He says don't abuse drugs, when He says um, you know, don't get addicted to these certain things, when He says don't be a practicer of, of these certain lifestyles, why is that? It's for your own good. It's not that He's trying to hold you back. That, that's not why your parents gave you rules because they didn't care about you. It was the opposite, wasn't it? Because they did care about you. All Jesus is concerned about is what is best for us. So in verse 11, He says, I am the Good Shepherd. The Good Shepherd lays down His life for His sheep. I am the Good Shepherd. Again, Ezekiel 34, 11 through 12. I am God is what He's saying. I am the Good Shepherd. To the Pharisees, the teachers of the Bible that were in that crowd that they were, he was talking to, they could not hear Jesus saying what he says in John 10 verse 11 without thinking about Ezekiel 34. They couldn't have. And Jesus says, I am the good shepherd. That's saying that I am God. Number two, he's saying I am the good shepherd. Well, what makes him the good shepherd? Because unlike the hired hands, that don't really care about the sheep, that's going to run when a bear or a lion attacks, the good shepherd is the one that's going to put himself between the lion or bear and the sheep, between the wolf and the sheep, between the robbers and the sheep, and say, if you're going to get to them, you're going to have to come through me. We, we've never really talked about this, but every time that our family has stayed in a hotel room, no matter what side of the bed we normally sleep on, I always sleep on the side of the bed that is closest to the door of the hotel. Now, maybe it's not necessary, but subconsciously my thinking behind that is somebody comes through that door, they're going to have to go through me to get to my family. Jesus says... The only way they're going to get to you is to come through me. I'm willing to lay my life down for my sheep. And he's going to prove that before this book is over, isn't he? That he really is the good shepherd. In verse 12, He who is a hired hand and not a shepherd, who does not own the sheep, sees the wolf coming and leaves the sheep and flees, and the wolf snatches them and scatters them, because the sheep doesn't belong to him. So he just does what's in his own interest. What's best for him, not what's best for the sheep. Snatching them and scattering them. Uh, that, the, the word, the original word there in the Greek is a word that uh, literally means to snatch something like a dog. Uh, it's the same word that he's going to use down in verse uh, 29. Uh, no one is able to snatch them out of my Father's hands. There, 
the idea is that if I've got a hold of them, no one can pull them away from me. No one can separate you from the love of God. And you can walk away from Him, but if He's got you, He's got you. Verse 13, He says, He flees because He is a hired hand and cares nothing for His, his sheep. A, a shepherd is concerned about a sheep. If a man is not concerned about the sheep, then he's going to not care about it. And so, that's some of the, again, you look back into a shepherding from the, uh, a local congregation point of view. If a man is not concerned about sheep, is not concerned about spiritual things before he's an elder, he's not going to be concerned about the sheep, about spiritual things after he's appointed. If he's not spiritual before, he won't be after. If he's not active and working before, he won't be active and working after. When you appoint an elder, you're just recognizing what God has already done in the life of someone. You don't make somebody an elder. If he's not concerned about the sheep, he doesn't need to be a shepherd. Because God cares about his sheep. See? And Jesus is saying, what makes me the good shepherd is is that I'm always, always, always going to have your best interest at heart. I always am going to care more about you than anyone else. That's what shepherds do. I, there's lots of people that love me and care about me. But I know for a fact that no one loves or cares about me more than my mama, than my daddy than my grandmother, than, than my wife. Those are people that, that uh, are always putting me before them. And they've proven that time and time and time again, even with nothing in return. And I hope my boys know how much that I love y'all, that, that no other man loves them more than I do. But at the same time, one of my jobs as a daddy is to teach them that as much as I love them, there's somebody that loves you even more than your daddy does. And that's Jesus. He cares about his sheep. And so he repeats again um, in verse 14, I am the good shepherd. I know my own, and my own know me. I am the good shepherd. He is. He's the one that cares about us more than anyone. Um, and He knows us. And we know His voice. And we listen to Him and we follow Him and we'll follow no other if we've allowed Him to be the shepherd of our lives. Verse 15, Just as the Father knows me and I know the Father and I lay down my life for the sheep. There is a relationship between sheep and shepherd that is unique and special. Much like the relationship between God the Father and Jesus, God the Son. What is it that made that relationship? What is it that made that, that trust that we have in Jesus? It, it's the fact that He died for us. John 3.16 and 1 John 3.16. Both carry that same idea. You have to show people you love them first. And then they'll respect you and follow you. See? That, that's true with shepherds. You know, uh, if shepherds in a congregation want to be loved and respected and followed, they've got to show the congregation that they love them. They've got to be there for them. That's true with preachers. Uh, you're ne I don't care how good you are in the pulpit. If you're not good at ministering to people and involved in their lives and build relationships, it, it's not going to matter. They're not going to listen to you. They're not going to follow. It's true with with children and parents. I can preach and teach and, and fuss at my boys all day. If behind that they don't know that I love them, they're not going to respect me and follow me. Why should we respect, love, trust, and follow Jesus? It's because he's, He built the relationship on His love and on what He's done for us while we were yet sinners. He died for us. Verse 16, And I have other sheep that are not of this fold. I must bring them also, and they'll listen to my voice, so there will be one flock, one shepherd. So what's he talking about here? Well, he's got to be talking about the Gentiles. 
What would make the Gentiles His sheep? The same thing that made the Jews His sheep. They have to hear His voice. They have to follow Him. That's what makes you one of His sheep, whether you are Jew or Gentile. There, there's nothing in the context that makes you think that, that it's, He's talking about Gentile. Nothing really in John does. But that's got to be what He's talking about. And that was a slow process, but it was one that God demanded. When you see the church, once you get over to Acts chapter 10 and 11, from that point forward, when, when the gospel is opened up to the Gentile world, what you see God demanding, and it's in letter after letter that's written in the first century, uh, it's in the, the book of Acts, you've, you've got lots of problems between Jew and Gentile, but what God tells them through the Spirit, through inspired writers, is I want you to be one. You know, it's interesting, especially now with the conversation that our, our nation is having. It's a conversation that we should have been church out in front leading on. Nowhere in the Bible do you see it saying, well, I'll tell you what would be maybe the best thing to do. I know you have different cultural backgrounds and, and that type of thing, so why don't you have a Jewish con congregation on one side of town and a Gentile congregation on the other side of town? You don't see that. Now, some of you are going to hear me say that, and you're not going to like that, and you're going to get upset about that, and, and that's fine, but your problem is not with me, it's with the Lord. And as long as we are showing the world that there is not one flock that we're showing we're not really listening to the shepherd. And, and it's time for us to be one flock. It's long past time for us to be one flock. That's what He wants us to be. Verse 17, For this reason the Father loves me, because I lay down my life that I may take it up again. No one takes it from me, but I lay it down of my own accord. I have authority to lay it down, and I have authority to take it up again. This charge I have received from my Father. Lay down my life becomes a key phrase here. God sent Jesus to lay down His life. It's not being forced on Him. He wants to do it. He wants to do that for a sheep. He, one of the things that's interesting, if you'll notice, uh, the, the next time that Jesus uses this kind of terminology is when He's talking to Pilate. See, Jesus was in control that whole time. We sing the song, He could have called 10,000 angels to destroy the world and set Him free. Actually, the Bible says He could have called a lot more than 10,000 angels, but I'm thinking 10,000 would have done the trick. To, if He'd have wanted to wipe out everybody, that would have probably been enough. But He didn't. Jesus, John chapter 1, tells us is the creative force behind all this. Before the foundation of the world, this plan was in the mind of God. Before creation ever happened, God knew that we would sin, that we would turn away, and God in His righteousness and His holiness would demand a penalty for sin. But God in His graciousness and His love would say, I'm going to pay the price for you. And the one who pays the price the one who actually is going to go to the cross and die is the same one, John 1 says, that said, let there be, and there was. All things were created by Him. Nothing was made that was not created. So it seems to me that if you knew this is what it was going to come, why even create it? I've heard people that, that you know put in swimming pools behind their house, and three years later they're like, I don't know why in the world we put that swim pool. If I knew it was going to be this much trouble, I never would have never would have done it. Jesus knew we were going to be this much trouble. And he did it anyway. That's love. But he was in control the whole time. He was going to submit to the Father's will. He laid down his life. And then the good news is, he's going to take it up again. Verse 19 says, here we go again, there was a division among the Jews because 
of these words. Seems like there's always a division when Jesus speaks. And there was in chapter 6, there was in chapter 8, and now there is again. And here's the division. Some reject Him and some accept Him. And there's no middle ground. And you know what makes the difference of whether you reject Him or you uh, accept Him? is what you do with His words. Do you reject His words or do you accept His words? Now what makes the difference whether you reject His words or accept His words? In context, who hears His voice? His sheep. Sometimes we don't listen to what He says and we don't do what He says. Not because we don't know it, but because we don't really want to be one of His. Sometimes we don't go to church because I know what they're going to tell me I need to do and I don't really want to do it. Sometimes we don't want to talk to the preacher because I know what he's going to tell me I need to do and I don't really want to do it. Many of them said, He has a demon and he is insane. Why listen to him? Others said, These are not the words of one who is oppressed by a demon. Can a demon open the eyes of the blind? So this idea of being a demon has come up before back in chapter 7. They've tried it time and again to say this is maybe what but it doesn't make sense he's a guy that brought sight to the blind remember we saw that in chapter 9 on Friday so what's the point of the first 21 verses of John chapter 10 Jesus is the good shepherd and Jesus is the door he's the only way to get into safety to go through to get to pasture. He's the only one we can trust and follow. It doesn't matter who the preacher is. It doesn't matter who the elders are. The preacher's not in charge. The elders are not in charge. You know who's in charge? Jesus is in charge. And we've got to listen to Him. We've got to follow Him. Not because Corey said it, not because you like the way I teach or preach or don't like the way I teach or preach. We're accepting or rejecting Jesus and His words. So which, which camp do you want to be in? Those who reject Him or those who accept Him? Are you willing to listen to the voice of the Good Shepherd? He's proven His love for you and that He laid down His life for you. Then he took his life up, proving that he was who he claimed to be. He deserves our respect. He deserves our honor. He deserves our love. And if we get who he is and if we get what he's done for us, we can't help but want to be one of his sheep and follow him. Let's pray. Our Father, we are grateful for your love and mercy and compassion that allowed uh, your son Jesus to come to this earth and be the, this perfect sacrifice, the perfect atonement for our sins. Father, we're thankful that he is the good shepherd. We're thankful that we have his example to follow. And we pray that we would be true followers of him, that we would seek to be like him, that we would seek to honor him and glorify him in all that we say and do and think, that we would not be shy about telling others about Him because we can't help but want to tell others about the great love that's been shown to us by and through Jesus. And Father, tonight especially we pray for our shepherds of our congregation, not only the Bear Valley congregation, but so many other congregations throughout the brotherhood that especially here lately have had to make such hard decisions. We pray that You would strengthen them and encourage them that you would help us to uh, be lifters of their arms and, and to be supporters and encouragers of them, to show our love and respect for them. Help them to set the right example and lead us in the right way. Help us to be those that are easy to lead. Help us to unite into one body. Let nothing divide us. Not, not skin color, not racial, not places that we live that are different on the earth, not economic status. Nothing divides us. That we might be one. And that because we have the unity and the love that we should in Jesus, that the world around us would see us and know that we're His disciples. 
and in a very divided and fractured world right now, that they would want and thirst for that kind of unity, that kind of love, that kind of togetherness. And it allow us to show us, show them about you and about your love. Father, thank you for Jesus. Help us to love him and you more every day. Help us to love each other more every day. And help us, Father, to do all we can to bring honor to your name. It's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. Well, we are glad that you are here with us. We are thankful that uh, you have chosen to be with us. Hope you will uh, come back on Friday night. Now, don't remember Wednesday. Don't forget, rather. Don't forget that Wednesday night, Tyler King will be teaching from the book of Daniel again. And Tyler is doing a great job with that study. You'll be blessed to be a part of that. Uh, Tyler is one of the brightest young minds in our brotherhood. And I, I, I don't have any reservations in saying that one bit. So you will be blessed if you'll come uh, to these same stations and uh, YouTube channels, um, Facebook pages, all those types of ways that you're getting this and uh, study along with Tyler on Wednesday night at 5 Mountain Time. Friday at 5 Mountain Time, we'll have another lesson from the Gospel of John, and we'll look at the last 21 verses of chapter 10. We hope that you'll be here for that. We hope you have a great week, a, a great rest of the uh, Lord's Day. Uh, have a good week this week, and that you'll be uh, with us again on Friday evening at the close of the week. Most of all, we hope you remember that we love you and God does too. Garrett, I am your father. <sighs> Click here and you can find the playlist of all of these videos. Click here and you can find the last video from this series. Click this round thing up here and you can subscribe to the YouTube channel and get all of these videos. It's free. We love you. God does too. See you on Friday.